Should J. Trump is, as noted by the impeccable Scott McFarlane of CBS News, now the oldest presidential nominee in American history, the flag bearer of the Republican Party. And by the way, the flag now depicts the late great Hannibal Lecter failing to get away from a shark, one of them Sharknado type flying sharks because it's cloudy. So Hannibal Lecter's electric tank doesn't work. The flag bearer of the Republican Party is now older than was Ronald Reagan the day he left the presidency with dementia. On the other hand, the vice president of the United States crossed 1,000 pledged delegates early yesterday afternoon and should have the requisite 1,986 of them by tonight, tomorrow, sure. As to fundraising, Vice President Harris raised $81 million in the first 24 hours of her presidential campaign, an all-time record. Act Blue, the grassroots fundraising organization for all Democratic candidates, raised $90 million in the same 24 hours. Future Forward, the flagship super PAC, with a good relationship with President Biden, got $150 million in new commitments from major Democratic donors in the same 24 hours. There had already been a quarter of a billion in the Democratic kitty. That was at 4 p.m. yesterday. There is a $600 million anti-Trump war chest. Was a $600 million anti-Trump war chest, probably higher by now, and also by now. It's $11 billion. We are beginning to get the first real-time post-Biden withdrawal polling, morning consult, showing most Democratic voters think Kamala Harris has the best chance in victory in November and are rallying behind her. They conducted a survey entirely after the announcement on Sunday showing the president's decision to end his campaign and endorse the vice president is popular with voters, could lead to an enthusiasm boost among Democrats, you think? As the majority of the electorate, as they phrase it, appears comfortable with him completing his term. Among 10 potential replacements for Biden, Harris performs best against Trump. Kamala Harris starts her race down 47, 45 to Trump. And oh, by the way, Joe Manchin, who's on this list, suddenly said, oh, no, I'm not going to run for the Democratic nomination after all. When somebody reminded him that he had made a big deal of no longer being a registered Democrat. Sorry, Senator, oh, we're out of the blanks. Uh, you'll, uh, we don't have any more. You'll just have to stay a... Uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, a whore of the coal mining industry, I suppose. Is that your title? The numbers for Morning Consult, and some of these poll numbers are literally from yesterday. The generic Democrat would be trailing Trump 46-45. Kamala Harris, as I said, starts down 47-45. Buttigieg would be down 46-39. Newsom down 47-39. Whitmer 47-39. We can forget Manchin. Andy Bashir, 4637. 4637 also for Josh Shapiro. 4636 for Pritzker and Cooper. Wes Moore down 4735. They don't list Mark Kelly, who is getting a lot of buzz for vice president because astronaut, why not? Moderate, why not? Bald white guy, why not? And, and this cannot be discounted in terms of importance, the husband of Gabby Giffords, who is still an extraordinary figure within the Democratic Party. As to endorsements, no, the Obamas haven't endorsed anybody because they don't want this to be seen as a coordinated attempt to crown Kamala Harris, even though, let's see, what time is it now? She could be crowned as early as tonight. Whitmer, who already said she would not stand for Biden's role in the ticket if he gave it back, is co-chairing the Harris campaign. Shapiro has endorsed her. Wes Moore has endorsed her. The president has endorsed her. John Fetterman endorsed her. Wait, wasn't John Fetterman mocking everybody who's trying to talk the president into standing aside? Of course he was. He knew what was going on. We've all known what was going on, except for everybody who demanded that Biden recuse in February or March, when all it could have done by demanding that was 
And all that it did do by demanding that was make him and those around him more stubborn and dig in deeper, which is exactly what happened. You do what Fetterman did. You support the candidate. You let behind the scenes stay behind the scenes until the last possible minute. And when it changes, you support the new candidate. And we all knew that if the president did not wrap this up by the end of this past weekend, the figure leading the charge to get him to leave on his own and he left on his own would go public. And the figure was Nancy Pelosi. So what pops up in the media now from Politico? Senior Biden aides were bracing for former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who'd worked behind the scenes to encourage others in the party toward the kind of collective action that might finally push the president to end his campaign to go public this week and possibly even disclose Democratic polling, clarifying Biden's dire political straits. No kidding. I hadn't thought of that. Quote, Nancy made clear that they could do this the easy way or the hard way, said one Democrat familiar with private conversations who was granted anonymity to speak candidly because we here at Politico have no idea what we're doing. She gave them three weeks of the easy way. It was about to be the hard way. Again, I don't claim prescience on these things. I called for him at the last possible moment to leave the presidential slot on the ticket last Friday, because if he didn't, they'd go public this week. And here it is. Oh, by the way, polling, you say? When the campaign commissioned new battleground polling over the last week, it was the first time they had done surveys in some key states in more than two months, according to people familiar with the surveys. That's the old, what is that thing growing on my arm? Whatever you do, don't get it checked out. And the numbers were grim, showing Biden not just trailing in all six critical swing states, but collapsing in places like Virginia and New Mexico, where Democrats had not planned on needing to spend massive resources to win. Well, that's now over with. And the big winners, of course, are the pollsters, because now we're going to need a whole new set of polls, particularly in the swing states, where, as I pointed out last week, one of the groups pushing to get Joe Biden to stand down as he did, and we will build statues to him for doing this. And I will talk about this later in the week, in particular, about the future of Joe Biden as the elder statesman of the Democratic Party in a way that might have been achieved by Franklin Delano Roosevelt if he had lived. (sighs) One of those surveys suggested that the swing in the swing states to the generic younger qualified Democrat could be from down five and a half to plus seven and change. Almost a 13-point swing. It will not be that much because, as we pointed out before, the generic invisible Democrat or the generic invisible Republican always does better than the real-life ones. Still, how much do you need it to swing in the swing states? Half a point victory in the swing states would be a blowout. Also, after all this, you know who else has endorsed the vice president from her candidacy for the first getting the Democratic nomination and then for president of the United States? Oh, look at this, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi endorsed her, too. What a shock, huh? part the best part of all of this ah the third best part of this apart from the whole oh now we have a chance of saving democracy and uh hey guess what kamala harris is the other candidate that means trump is now old owns all the old and the too old and the too crazy and trump now owns all the parsing of his words and Suddenly, all of these experts on unintelligible presidential candidates will have to cover Trump. And he's old, old, old and crazy. But besides that, the Republicans have fulfilled the old joke about the dog catching the car. 
What are you going to do now? Well, Trump has his standard answer already. He wants to talk to the manager of elections, and he's going to sue him. You're not allowed to do this because he says so. Because he's a psychopath, and he's a Hitler. So, we are forced to spend time and money on fighting Joe Biden. He falls badly after having a terrible debate and quits the race. Now we have to start all over again. Shouldn't the Republican Party be reimbursed for fraud in that everybody around Joe, including his doctors and the fake news media, knew he was not capable of running for or being president? Just asking? Question mark? Number one, if you're saying just asking, the question mark renders it meaningless. Secondly... I have some change here somewhere. Wait, here we go. There's 50 cents. That reimburses you for all the money you spent on your clothes. He wants reimbursement. Who do you want the reimbursement from, shit haze? Who is it you're expecting the reimbursement from? I'll wait. You're going to sue... You're going to sue the Republicans. You're going to sue Jesus. You're going to sue Biden. You're going to sue each state. You're going to sue, sue studio. What, what are you going to, who, who are you going to sue? The best part of this is Trump had moments of lucidity. They're gone now. Somehow he really didn't think Biden would step aside. And certainly he had no plan in the event this actually happened. Now, you can argue that he's had no plan since about 1990, and he's just been making this crap up as he goes along. And unlike most of us who try to live that way, he's just hit it correctly by accident. And then one day, you run out of good accidents. And that day was Sunday. My debate with crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in the history of the United States, was slated to be broadcast on fake news ABC, the home of George, and he misspelled Stephanopoulos, sometime in September. Now that Joe has not surprisingly quit the race, but you're suing to stop him from quitting the race. You want money for this. I think the debate with whomever the radical left Democrats choose should be held on Fox News rather than very biased ABC. Thank you. Sure, we'll move it. It's his way at bargaining out of the debate. He will not take the stage against Kamala Harris because if he took the stage against Kamala Harris, they would, at the end of the debate, have to go out and collect Trump with spoons and a tureen. Felon, Republican Party. Prosecutor, Democratic Party. Joe just got knocked out, so now I'll have to do it a fourth time. That uh, fourth time, is that uh, E. Jean Carroll? Biden is the worst president by far in the history of our nation. He's done everything possible to destroy our country. Blah, blah, blah. National security with sharks. Hannibal Lecter annihilated an earth-shattering debate. Now the corrupt radical throwing him overboard. Not fit to serve. Whatever the left picks up now will be just make America great again. Yeah, that was before it became obvious that it's going to be Harris. The Democrats pick a candidate. He loses the debate badly, then panics, makes mistake after mistake, is told he can't win, and decide they'll pick another candidate, probably Harris. They stole the race from Biden after he won it in the primaries at first. These people are the real threat to democracy. The logical failures in this statement are so many that even though we're on the Internet, I literally do not have enough infinity to explain this to him. Plus, he already moved on. Who is running our country right now? It's not Crooked Joe. He has no idea where he is. If he can't run for office, he can't run our country. Okay, so let me put it to you this way. Would you like to run against President Kamala Harris? Nah, I didn't think so, genius. Biden never had COVID. He's a threat to democracy. Ooh, he caught threat to democracy disease, did he? Tested positive for that? You know how you get rid of that? You shove bleach up your ass. And a light. Trump tries it weekly. It's not over. Tomorrow, Joe Biden's going to wake up and forget that he dropped out of the race today. Ha, 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 ha. Don made a funny. The Democrats, guess what? It is over. The Democrats pick a candidate. He loses the debate. Oh, I read that twice. I'm turning into Trump. Now, just watching the fake news, and they're doing their very best to turn the worst president in the history of our country into a brilliant and heroic leader. He was heroic because he quit. Yes. 
He was heroic because he quit. You might learn something from that if you had been capable of learning at any date later than, say, June 1st, 1957. Mr. Dementia. And to turn dumb as a rock, Kamala Harris, once again, if she's dumb as a rock, you should be able to debate her on, I don't know, Kamala Harris TV and beat the hell out of her, shouldn't you? From a totally failed and insignificant vice president. Okay, you tried to kill your vice president. Any vice president who survived their term without the president trying to kill them is automatically not insignificant and not totally failed, Dondi. No, it just doesn't work that way. Yes, it does. You're about to find out. Here's my advice. You have plenty of time now. You're going to lose the election now. Flee. Because if you don't flee, you're going to die in prison. And here's a prediction. He's going to use a racial epithet about the future president of the United States before the end of the month. Maybe the end of the week, isn't he? Isn't the crazy old man yelling at the cloud? And they are talking about suing. I swear to Jesus. Listen to Mike Johnson speaking of swearing at Jesus. Trump fobbed this. You can't change nominees, even though the nomination isn't legal for another month. Nuisance suit. He's put this all on poor, dumb Speaker Mike Johnson, who also insists that if Joe Biden is going to leave the ticket, which they're not going to let him do by the lawsuits that he mentions at the beginning of this, he must resign the presidency, which they will force him to do because 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 something about Hannibal Lecter sharks. You said you may sue her in all 50 states. What are they? What are you alleging that they're breaking? I never said I was going to sue her. I said that we have 50 different systems uh, in each of the states when it comes to presidential elections and choosing electors and all the rest. And in some of the states, there are impediments to just switching someone out like that. And I have uh, suggested that the president should resign. The reason is, if everyone acknowledges that he is incapable of running a campaign, then he's clearly incapable of running the country. I'd like to point out that if inability to run a campaign disqualifies you from being president, (laughs) well, look, Trump became the first incumbent president to lose his campaign to keep the White House in 28 years. And he lost, we tend to forget this, he lost both of his coups, at least two coups. And he lost the midterms in 2018, and they underperformed in the midterms in 2022. Trump is like one for six in campaigns. That makes him ineligible to be president, doesn't it? Ah, but in terms of eligibility, Mike Johnson is an idiot. If Biden were to resign, retire, and Harris were to become president, Well, we know House Republicans will never approve a new vice president nominated via the 25th Amendment, unless it's Trump Jr. So, golly, Speaker Mike Johnson, who would be next in line to the presidency under President Harris if there's no VP. Wait, Speaker Mike Johnson? That's Speaker Mike Johnson's name. Speaker Mike Johnson would be next in line under President Harris if there's no vice president. I mean, what a coincidence that is. And he's arguing for Biden to resign. What a shock. I know. I thought this was going to be Taylor Swift. Sue somebody, Mike. Sue. Sue. Sue Dio. We're a little ragged today. I don't know if the show will end up being too long or too short, Uh, as I will explain in depth much later. And as you may have seen in social media, my beloved rescue dog, Mine, who turned 17 a week ago yesterday, died on Sunday. Uh, It's never a happy story. This was happier than most. I'll tell it to you later. But forgive me for being a little all over the place. And uh, there are a couple of bloopers and mistakes. I called Trump something earlier in the show, and I don't even know what I said. Lauren Boebert, I demand proof of life from Joe Biden today by 5 p.m. He needs to get in front of some camera and discuss if he's aware that he's dropped out. Hiding is completely unacceptable. Listen, lady, don't get near the subject of videos of 
proof of life. Because the last video we saw of you in a theater, in the dark, sitting next to some guy on the first date, giving him the old five-finger discount. Maybe, maybe. I understand you have the IQ of the printer that prints out my script. Maybe a little less. But certainly, you should never mention videos or proof-of-life videos or I demand ever again. Joe Biden is unfit to stand trial. Joe Biden is unfit to debate. Joe Biden is unfit to run for re-election. But Joe Biden is fit to serve out the remainder of his term. Make it make sense. I tried to, Lauren Boebert, but you have the IQ of my printer. On a good day. A few other notes. Sean Hannity also didn't see this coming. I mean, honest to God, these are the people who are running that half of the country, and they did not foresee the actual prospect after calling for Joe Biden to leave the campaign of Joe Biden actually leaving the campaign. It's all so performative that they have built into their own minds the idea that none of it will ever happen, and therefore they can say anything because they know, well, I know it was irresponsible and it started a war, but I didn't think anybody would actually actually do it. We're just entertainment here. Now it happens. Sean Hannity's scotch squirted out his nose. Here's just one reason voters seem to detest Kamala Harris. Plays a bunch of clips of Kamala Harris laughing. Number one, it's a great laugh. Number two, it only dawned on me when I saw this. Trump doesn't laugh at all. He tries to get you to laugh at disabled people, at foreigners, at people of color, at the people who harvest your food and cook it for you, the people who serve you at the West Moron Cowboy Boot Store in West Moron, Oklahoma. He likes to make fun of all of them. He likes you to laugh. Have you ever heard him laugh? And by the way, Name me another human who has not lost the ability to vocalize, who does not laugh at all. Here's just one reason voters seem to detest Kamala Harris. By the way, yes, my Sean Hannity impression, for those of you who remember SportsCenter, is the same as my old Phil Rizzuto impression. Phil Rizzuto for the money store. And I'll defend the late Phil Rizzuto. The last time I saw him, before he passed away, obviously, he was giving me points on how to crumple up the piece of paper at the end of the show and get a better grip because Phil Rizzuto watched Countdown every night. And I had known Phil Rizzuto since 1968. And I said, Phil, you're a liberal? And he went, shh, don't tell anybody. Also from Hannity. She wants to ban plastic straws. I love my plastic straws. I hate paper straws. You use straws with your whiskey? He's literally grasping at straws. The entire Republican Party is so destroyed by this. Everything was built on the idea they're running against Joe Biden. Joe Biden is old. Joe Biden is the only person in America older than Donald Trump. He may be the only person who's less capable in a public setting of guaranteeing that he's going to say what he intends to say than Donald Trump. And now all of a sudden the field is cleared. There's nothing else standing out there propping Trump up. His crazy is on stage by itself. It's the hamlet of crazy in the soliloquy. To be or have elected. A couple of other items. Washington Post, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I'm saying this, not them, solicited a bribe in the form of a job from Trump. Independent presidential candidate Robert woo -woo, F. Kennedy Jr. held talks this month with former President Donald woo -hoo, woo -hoo, Trump about endorsing his campaign, Kennedy endorsing Trump's campaign, bad sentence structure post, and taking a job in a second Trump administration, that'll be the one in hell, overseeing a portfolio of health and medical issues. Well, if there's anybody who's going to bring health and medical issues to this team, it's Trump and Kennedy. The discussions, which began hours after the attempted assassination of Trump at a rally on July 13th. Hey, my running mate whose name I've forgotten has disappeared. Uh, 
Trump's not dead. Call him. This did not result in an agreement amid concerns in Trump's orbit about the complications of promising a job in exchange for a political endorsement. When usually they just operate with money. Oh, no, that, that, that's not in the post. I said that. All I will say to you is I'm willing to talk to anybody from either political party who wants to talk about children's health and how to end the chronic disease epidemic, Kennedy said Monday in a bullshit statement. Oh, no, I said that, too. Adding that Trump has been more open to him than the Democratic National Committee. That's because the DNC recognizes you're crazy. You're committable, Bob. As an old friend of yours, honest to God, go into a voluntarily induced coma. You'll do the least damage that way. Pop back up around November 6th. The rest will do you good. They've allocated millions to try to disrupt my campaign. Yeah, and they just raised another $300 million since Sunday. So your campaign is going to get disrupted. Guess what has gotten buried by all of this stuff? Did you see the statement by ex-doctor Ronnie Jackson about the bullet we still do not have anything resembling confirmation that what hit Trump's ear and caused the loss of well over a tenth of an ounce of blood, that that was a bullet that grazed him miraculously instead of, you know, at least taking the ear off, possibly leaving some sort of trace Or, if it really was a bullet, even though there were no bullets around him and the four cops from Pittsburgh who were standing nearby just got hit by pieces of plastic. Josh Marshall noted something of importance, which I think is as relevant as the fact that Trump is still lying about the bullet. Whatever the truth is, he's not telling it. Could be there's a bullet, as I suggested. Who knows? Maybe the bullet had a picture of Trump on it. Literally the bullet with your name on it. Josh Marshall noted, as I alluded to earlier, it was learned today that top decision makers at major news organizations seem to assume that Trump's bullet story is just his personal opinion. And they've been unwilling to ask for more information because they don't think it matters that much. And they fear that if they press for any details or some official word beyond what a Trump decided on his own, there'd be retribution. That's journalism. Well, we can't we can't ask them about a basic element of human history. I mean, this is going to go in the books as an assassination attempt. It turns out he got hit in the ear with a really old piece of rolled up bubble gum. Couple more. It's not over on election day. Said Chris LaCivita, who is essentially running or co-running the Trump campaign in an event at the convention. Remember the Republicans at the convention? Do you know they nominated J.D. Vance? J.D. Vance? You ever seen the original version of the movie Bedazzled? Peter Cook and Dudley Moore? Peter Cook sings a song with the priceless line, You fill me with inertia. J.D. Vance. Of all of these Republicans who are willing to say and do anything to get elected, they found somebody who was the dullest and least convincing of the apocalyptic preachers? I mean, Mike Johnson is an enthusiastic lunatic compared to this. I mean, check him for a pulse. He makes Mike Pence look like a male stripper. It's not over on Election Day. It's over on Inauguration Day, says Chris LaCivita. We're in conversation with Politico's Jonathan Martin. Two things about this. It's not over on Election Day. It's over on Inauguration Day. Coup 2025. Yes, we'll see about that one. Because there is one thing that is unavoidably clear at this point. The official in charge of certifying the Electoral College results will be the Democratic president for camp president, uh, the Democratic nominee for president and the vice president of the United States. And... The president of the United States and who might be the president-elect, they would be the ones in charge of the, what's the word? Military. 
By the way, the interview with Chris Lacevito of the Trump campaign by Jonathan Martin of Politico, this was conducted before Jonathan Martin went on BBC World News and each of his two earbuds popped out, one or another. First, I believe the left one just fell out in a close-up and then the right one. I tweeted it. It was like his brain farted twice and out popped his earbuds. I think they were earbuds. They could have been brains. This question was raised, and it does explain an awful lot about the entirety of the Trump campaign since the day he came down that goddamned escalator. Is it possible, someone asked, that Trump just doesn't know that the word asylum has two different meanings? Does this explain why he thinks political prisoners claiming asylum coming here from Venezuela are, in fact, from insane asylums? Well, it is the word asylum. It means just one thing. There's a law that says words can only mean one thing. Right? That's why wind power only works when there's wind. So, things are better than they were last week. I'm claiming no credit whatsoever for what happened, except for maybe knowing a little bit more of the timing that other people did. And I'm sorry I couldn't say anything else, but the point of it was to wait till Biden was ready. And we did. And now everybody can go to work with a few hundred million dollars that we did not have on Sunday morning. And the last thing that I've heard repeatedly from friends of mine who are terrified, not that Kamala Harris wouldn't make a great president, not that she is not completely qualified for the job and for the race, against Trump for the electoral strains, for everything else involved in the process, but simply they're worried about America. We are misogynistic and we are racist, period. And I pointed out that the last four elections for president in this country, 2008, 12, 16, and 20, the following things happened. In the first one, we elected a president who was a man of color. In 2012, we re-elected him. 2016, we did not win anything. And by we, I mean, you know, democracy and representative government. But what happened even in the worst of these, and the most calamitous of them of all time, the woman candidate won the popular vote in this society of misogyny and racism. And in the fourth of them, in 2020, the very same woman of color we're talking about was elected vice president of the United States, defeating the ticket led by a racist incumbent and his vice president, the guy he wanted to hang. Now, assume nothing going forward. Lots of things could go wrong. Lots of people who did not know which was left on their bodies and which was right. They have the vote. They found out how to vote. Assume nothing, but just rejoice. In terms of getting her into the White House, the last four elections suggest it can be done. Rejoice, Excelsior. Also of interest here, we've only scratched the surface of the stupid things that people said about Biden withdrawing. Trump? Ah, uh, sure. Mike Johnson? You betcha. Hannity? Of course. But there's also the worst persons in the world, and they are Brian Stelter, Olivia Newsy, Katie Turr, and Aaron Sorkin. Keith Alderman, this is your life! And I will tell you, as I've mentioned once already... The story of the passing of the wonderful pup, Mine. Bless him. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. of us on this edition of Countdown, the life and death of Mine Germain Olbermann, 2007-2024, who would, if there were such a thing, hold world records for all forms of precision leaping 
over crosswalk stripes by any dog over the age of 15 and under 10 pounds in weight. Mine in memoriam coming up. First, there are still more idiots to talk about. They never stop. They never take a day off. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. So many to choose from. Unprecedented events bring out unprecedented stupidity. The bronze, worse, good old Aaron Sorkin. You may ask yourself, What's his newest TV series going to be about? Is it going to be about a former top sportscaster and former top TV political commentator doing a podcast? No. Is it going to be something else for my life? Because, you know, using two aspects of my career might not be sufficient for one lifetime for Aaron and not paying me for the second one when he said he was going to. No, 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 no. This is unrelated to me though not unrelated to him. Saturday night, Sunday morning, a Times op-ed appears literally hours before President Biden withdraws from the race. Aaron Sorkin, how I would script this moment for Biden and the Democrats. The first nine paragraphs are not about Joe Biden, nor about the Democrats. They are about Well, I'll read you the opening paragraph. The Paley Center for Media just opened an exhibition celebrating the 25th anniversary of The West Wing, the NBC series I wrote from 1999 to 2003. Some of the show's story points have become outdated in the last quarter century. The first five minutes of the first episode depended entirely on the audience being unfamiliar with the acronym POTUS, while others turned out to be, well, not prescient, but sadly... Coincidental. In paragraph 10, at their convention next month, the Democrats should nominate Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney, hello. Nominating Mr. Romney, continues Mr. Sorkin, if he did write this, would be putting our money where our mouth is. A clear and powerful demonstration that this election isn't about what our elections are usually about but about stopping a deranged man from taking power. Surely Mr. Romney, who doesn't have to be introduced to voters, would peel off enough Republican voters to win, probably by a lot. What's the shelf life of mushrooms? I don't know this off the top of my head, and the day being what it's been, I haven't had a chance to research this. It's 2001 that they picked Aaron up with the mushrooms in his carry-on bag on the flight. Was it to Vegas? Was it from Vegas? Did he know which? I I don't know what to say about this idea of nominating Mitt Romney as the Democratic nominee when the Vice President of the United States is sitting there. And it's been clear all along that all of the double haters who Sorkin does refer to in his op-ed, all of them were leaning towards Biden anyway, and that Joe Biden, and we now understand the extent of the worries and the angst and the clenched teeth and turned stomachs with which even his most ardent supporters have been operating the last few months. Even under those circumstances, there were paths for Joe Biden to win re-election. So clearly the solution is not to take the vice president of the United States, who's been vice president of the United States, just in case something were to happen to the president of the United States. And here... Something has happened to the president of the United States. He's decided not to run for re-election. Who, 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 who replaces him? It's too bad that the Constitution gives us no guidance on how a political party should do that, especially when it hasn't officially nominated anybody yet. He didn't steal this from me. Aaron Sorkin did not steal this from me. He stole it from Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the latest Republican stooge wearing those no i'm straight glasses all right enough of this i'd just like to point out once again that if you've ever seen the newsroom the pilot episode is play by play and in some cases word for word what happened to me when lawrence o'donnell tried to take countdown away from me while my dad was dying in early 2010 and if you think that was a problem i had a friend who was a gossip columnist for the new york post and she showed me where 
emails that she had sent to Aaron Sorkin while they were dating wound up word for word in the script in the mouth of the gossip columnist in the newsroom series. I just want to point one thing out about this. Unlike the newsroom, unlike the previous series, Sports Night, in which two characters based on me, but who both looked like Craig Kilborn, he did not borrow this idea from me. Thank God. I'd also like to emphasize, after reading this particular idea, that it's ever more clear that the West Wing succeeded because of Marty Sheen and Brad Whitford and John Spencer, the late John Spencer and Janelle Maloney and Allison Janney and Richard Schiff and all the rest, in spite of Aaron Sorkin. Written entirely by Aaron Sorkin, except those parts written by somebody else. The runners-up, a tie, worser, Olivia Newsy of New York Magazine and Katie Turr of MSNBC. Start with Newsy first, although I believe she may be now pronouncing her name Nutsi. Or who knows? It's a Tuesday. It could be anything by now. A decade ago, Olivia was the most promising young writer in political media. The most promising. Barely got out of high school, thrown out of two colleges, and ascended quickly through the ranks to New York Magazine, where she has been ever since, and is now the world's youngest 75-year-old access journalist. For the first time, she has actually thought about what it is she is covering. This is a person who has gone into the White House and asked if Trump was there, and then sat down and interviewed him and never asked him any of the questions of the day, but just reported on what his desk looked like. The definition of access journalism. But finally, with this issue of Biden leaving the ticket and the election that is upcoming, that is an existential struggle for survival and the reality, that, I don't know, perhaps has dawned on her, that they will put her in the camps with the rest of us too, no matter how glowingly she portrayed Trump's desk. She has for the first time thought beyond what a good sentence would look like here into the meaning of what she's covered. And she got it wrong. The Democratic Party told its voters that they could not be trusted to select the nominee when they effectively shut down their primary process. Now, they're installing a new nominee. American voters happen to like democracy. I predict some backlash. <sighs> Another tweet from the moments right after the big event. And if you really have let your idea of what reality looks like outside of Washington, D.C., if your big goal in life is to get mentioned in the spotted at portions of the Politico playbook, if your goal in life is to get a six-part video interview series for Bloomberg Online and one of the guests is Eric Adams, who could walk into any station in this city and offer himself live to anchor the six o'clock news and all the news directors would go, no, no, dude, we want viewers. We don't want them to go away. If that's your goal, the idea should be that if there is a big event, shut up. Wait 24 hours before you write anything, because you're going to write something as stupid as the Democratic Party told its voters that they could not be trusted to select a nominee when they effectively shut down their primary process. They didn't. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. And there were other candidates and they got the crap kicked out of them. And in one case where Biden wasn't on the ballot, he still won by write ins. Now they are installing a new nominee. Well, they aren't because the current one stepped away from the, com the nomination before he was nominated. American voters happen to like democracy. Well, you work in Washington. How in the hell would you know that? How would anything you've written in the last 10 years suggest you know anything about that? I predict some backlash. The other tweet read, the big lesson here, bullying works. Oh, good God, it's the president of the United States. For months and months, people have been asking him nicely if he perhaps is not calibrated correctly to assess whether or not he is healthy enough to run for president or, more importantly, to get reelected president under these circumstances. And finally, over the weekend, he decided, you know what? 
all of these people are probably right. If it's a billion to one, they're probably right and I'm wrong. That's not bullying. That's common sense. They're going to build a statue to Joe Biden. If there's a statue to Olivia Newsy, it will be the scales of injustice or a giant whataboutism statue. She still writes an okay sentence. She has no clue where she is. She is on her way to becoming the Chris Saliza of Ryan Liz's of Olivia Newsies. Oh, and by the way, that reminds me, she has a book coming up with her fiance, Ryan Lizza, on Trump. It'll be coming out soon in the year 2020. She's tied with Katie Turr. That's a coincidence. Someone wrote on Twitter yesterday that after Katie Turr asked, this would have been yesterday, whether Kamala Harris was the kind of person voters would want to have a beer with. I'm never watching MSNBC again. I want a president who won't turn our country into a fascist hellscape. I'm not looking for a barstool partner. Apart from the fact that that question by Turr is right out of the 2000 and 2004 presidential elections, and she hasn't figured it out since then, apart from the stupidity of the question. Let's see, the entire world is on fire, but would you want to have a beer with Kamala Harris? You know what? Kamala Harris has a wicked sense of humor and does impersonations of senators. I would like to have a beer with Kamala Harris. How's that for an answer, Katie? Apart from that, though, as a political barometer, whether or not you'd like to have a beer with that candidate or the candidate would like to have a beer with you is particularly irrelevant and stupid because Donald Trump, for all the other things he does, does not drink. I mean, we're beginning to get reason to believe with the constant references to Hannibal Lecter that there's a small chance that Donald Trump has eaten human flesh at some point in his life. He keeps talking about it. And yet even knowing that is a small possibility, and I'm saying one one millionth of one percent chance that he's been a cannibal, that he calls him good old or the late great Hannibal Lecter, that there's a reason for that somewhere in that mice are loose. They got out of the wheel inside his brain, brain of his. Just accepting that as a one one millionth of a percent possibility, Donald Trump cannibalism, even then, Donald Trump does not drink. He cannot have a beer with you. I will again ask, plead that Katie Turr withdraw from the 2024 presidential campaign. However, there is still somebody who has topped these three nominees. Our winner, the gold medalist, Brian Stelter, network whereabouts unknown. No one, not Tur, not Saliza, not Liza without the S, not Newsy, not Nutsi, not Nuzzy, could have written this literally, I believe, 12 minutes after Biden withdrew. I expected that Biden would step aside, but I never imagined that he would do it via a paper statement on a Sunday afternoon. Does this timing and format make any sense? Brian kind of got ratioed on this. And here's the issue. President of the United States becoming an eternal hero with one decision. Yes, it took him months to do it. He had to listen to a lot of arguments. He was stubborn. He was the stubborn Joe Biden many of us have, oh, had a beer with, just a coincidence. He was all that, and yet finally he did the right thing, didn't he? But not for Brian Stelter, because he didn't do it correctly. He didn't fill out the right forms. He didn't hold a news conference. He didn't say, hey, uh, Kamala, would you get me Brian Stelter on the phone? I'd like to give him an exclusive. Well, I'll tell you after I tell him. No, no, just get Stelter on the phone. He'll know what it's about. Oh, my good God. What sense of this timing and format could there be for an 81-year-old president who has just decided to make himself a lame duck and retire when all he ever wanted to be was president and he believes in his heart he could be re-elected president? What sense could there be in an 81-year-old president with COVID choosing not to fulfill Brian's fantasies and hold a news conference or do a live interview or do a video but to continue to rest and in the notes say, I will address the nation later in the week. 
Oh, and by the way, doing it the way he did it protected the story from leaks. Was there one leak that he was going to announce it today, five minutes from now? Biden is composing the tweet as we speak. No, it was the most given the degree of difficulty and the number of people certain was going to happen. It was the most protected story in the world. Who said Sunday morning he's going to announce he's leaving the ticket Sunday afternoon? Who said at noon? Nobody said it. There is a chance that when I asked him to do it on Friday and I was waiting till the last possible minute, I can tell you that I might have come closest and I didn't come close at all. I was off by two days. Joe Biden not only did this, not only did this for his party, not only did this for democracy, not only did this for the nation, not only did this for the future of the planet, but he kept the story under seal all this time. Does this timing and format make any sense? The most sense of anything that's happened in Washington in like eight years and you're complaining about it. Brian Stelter, BS, the initials say it all, who peaked in the year 2005. Two days! Ah, uh, worse person than the I told you at the start of this episode that this one would be particularly ragged, more so than usual, more so than is the selling point of the series. And I told you why. My pack of dogs is down to three again. Mine died on Sunday afternoon at about 5.15 p.m. Natural causes. He was 17 years old. And his story is extraordinary, and I wanted to tell it to you because... I only know the last two years and about two months of it. I have joked previously, but contained within that joke is a very sincere thought. I would pay, sometimes I say $5,000, $10,000, $100,000 to see a full-length documentary program about the first 15 years of Mine Germain Olbermann's life. I know... He was born in New York on July 15, 2007, and that you helped me celebrate his 17th birthday just a week and a day ago. And until I encountered him in 2022, I knew nothing of him. And all the records, all the anecdotes, almost all of the verbal stories are gone because his human got sick and sicker and began to lose much of her cognitive function and declined and one day went to the hospital and did not come back and had made no arrangements for what was to happen to Mine and other dogs. She had at least two Malteses. We don't know what happened to them. I've heard stories that suggested they were left to fend for their own in an apartment for a while. Happily, I know that the neighbor and a former student of Ms. Germain who taught French a man named Keith Peterson, came across Mine and knew of Mine from the neighborhood and from his teacher and knew she had gone away and wondered what happened to the dogs, and he began to feed them. And he was prepared in the summer of 2022 to adopt Mine, and then something changed in his life, and he was going to be traveling once a month or so, perhaps more often, and the whole premise fell through. In addition to the fact that he recognized that Mine was not well. Something had happened to him. He kept bumping into things. He didn't walk correctly. His back looked a little crooked. It looked like something bad had happened to him neurologically. And he did not know what would be next or if he could care for Mine. So he went looking for an organization that might take care of Malteses. There must be some sort of Maltese Rescue Association. Well, there are two of them. One, the one I would recommend to you, is American Maltese Association Rescue. It is run by a dear friend of mine named Sue Levitt. And we take care of Malteses. That's where I got my little boy, Ted, who had a very bad heart and was not really believed to be a likely candidate to last 10 months, and Ted just turned six years old. 
and where we got Mishu, whose story I've told you before, who had Tetralogy of Fallot, a, a disease barely treatable in large dogs, let alone four or five pound Malteses, and he had a brilliant, happy, brief life. And he died in my arms at five and a half months old. And that happened in November of 2021, which is when I discovered I could handle four dogs at the same time. And again, I didn't have a dog in my life until 2012. I didn't know when I broke up with my girlfriend in 2015 if I could take care of two dogs by myself. And suddenly I had four, including one who was a hospice puppy. So after that, I was offered by the people who had bred uh, Mishu, uh, one of his brothers from a later um, litter. And they came in here and they were monsters. <laughs> Mishu was a wonderful dog who liked to start fights, had no energy, couldn't really oxygenate. He couldn't, he could breathe fine. He just could not, once the oxygen got into his bloodstream, he could not pass it anywhere around his body or insufficiently. So he would start fights and then sit back and watch the other dogs fight. On the other hand, he also was communal. He brought the dogs together, literally and figuratively. He was a lovely boy, and he just didn't live very long. But I was offered his brothers, and his brothers had all the strength in the world, and they were like something out of a horror film. They could climb up walls. The first one bit me, bit each of the other dogs, then came back and bit us all in the genitals. The next one was trouble. He was able to climb up out of his cage. He had the most beautiful marbles-like blue eyes I've ever seen on a dog. And he was a silent killer. These two dogs later found homes in which they were either the only male or the only dog, and they have had happy lives ever since. They did not have the same heart disease that felled poor Misho. In any event, after Mishu's passing and after the failed two weeks with Kubush and Snowy, Mishu's brothers. There were three of us again here in the household, three dogs and me, their human. And one day my friend Sue Levitt texted me and said, we've got a terrible case. We had a woman in Hell's Kitchen and she died in her 80s and she didn't take care of the dogs and there's one dog left. And I mean, he's 14 and he has dementia and he has bad teeth and who's going to adopt that? And I sent back the raised hand emoji because you know, as I've said previously, you don't know till you have a dog that the answer to the question, what is the meaning of life, is not fully answered by the word dogs, but it's partially answered by that word. One of the reasons of life, one of the reasons for life, one of the reasons for putting up with life, one of the reasons for putting up with other humans is dogs. And honestly, the only thing I can think of in the column of what's good about mankind is we've, lots of us, taken care of dogs and other pets too. Other than that, I don't know what purpose we have. Other than that, I don't know what good, what net good we have done this planet or where we would fit into some sort of scheme, whether it is intentional, created, or accidental. The through line to all the theories about why we are on earth, from atheism to the most pure religious doctrinaire theories all have this one through line as the great bill hicks said people suck i can prove it on an etch-a-sketch in any event i'm meandering on this to try to avoid the topic of poor mine so i raised my hand and the warning was mine is not going to interact with you something happened to him he has dementia he really doesn't know where he is He's okay outside, but he's really confused. His human went away after 14, nearly 15 years, and he doesn't know what happened to her. And Maltese is particularly attached to one human for life. And if something happens to that human, something will happen to the Maltese. So came a day in June of 2022 when Keith Peterson brought Mine and it's a French name, M-I-N-E-T. It means kitty in French, colloquial French. Mine is kitty. And as I said right then, this must have led to extraordinary confusion in his first 15 years. Something else to put in the documentary. Mine and Keith Peterson and I met up outside one of the entryways into Central Park. 
and I picked Mine up and sat him on my lap and noticed two things. One was his teeth smelled from a distance, from feet. They were so bad away, from feet away, his teeth smelled. He was a thin dog, but not scary thin. He just was very, very wiry. And he was standing there on my lap, and he decided he didn't want to do that anymore, so he leaped to the pavement. And I thought to myself, let's not leave him up in places where he can leap because he doesn't have any idea when not to leap, which proved to be another through line in his existence. So fingers crossed and hoping to improve his lot for however many months or years he had left, in came Mine to join the rest of my pups. They really didn't know what to make of him. They didn't interact much. Mine did a lot of sleeping. He was, after all, a month shy of his 15th birthday and not in good health. And the rest of the time was heartbreaking. Mine walked around the house. Always this could be said of him. He did his steps and he hydrated a lot. He must have walked every day a mile or two miles indoors. And sadly, when he got here, you could have traced the pattern having watched him do it once or twice, exactly where he would walk in my apartment, where he would bump into walls. And it became pretty evident to me that he was retracing the steps at Madame Germain's house that he could not adjust to a new apartment. He could not adjust to new walls. The other dogs, well, there were other dogs, but they weren't the right dogs. And then there was the smell of his teeth. My vet came to look at him, and Mine slept a lot and didn't really interact. He ate pretty well. He ate okay. And then my vet came in and said, I'm looking at his teeth, and some of these teeth are in such bad shape that I'm afraid they will begin to infect his airways. There's no sign of this spreading. His heart is great. His heart is extraordinary for a 14, 15-year-old dog. It would be a good heart for a 6-year-old dog or a 6-month-old dog. He's got a strong ticker. He's going to live a while. But these teeth will kill him if you don't do something about it. I think you need to get a hold today of the veter the veterinary dentists, the dental experts at the Animal Medical Center. In the interim, I think I can take a few of these teeth out right now with a little topical and maybe just my fingers. I've been through a lot with my dogs, and I've been surprised at how much I have been willing to be there for them when they have been in excruciating pain or fear. This is the only time in 12 years with dogs that I had to leave the room. The noises Mine made when he had barely spoken before, when he never barked. Howls of incredible pain and fear, and she only took out three or four of the teeth that were literally loose to the touch. So she stopped after, I think, six, and then we went into the animal medical center, and all his teeth were removed. I had my other dogs checked. Some of them lost half of their teeth. My little girl, Rose, had no symptoms of it, but she had advanced periodontal disease. She was very sick. She was about to be in the same situation Mine was without symptoms. It would have happened overnight. We took out half of her teeth. She woke up from the anesthesia. All of her allergies disappeared. Within weeks, her curvy puppy figure was back, and she was eight years old. I went into my dentist and I said, hey, I need to be about 20% smarter. Can you pull some of my teeth out? And the guy goes, I've got very bad news for you. You have an absolutely clean checkup. And I said, this is the first one since 1968. Sorry. Mine, having had all of his teeth removed, woke up from the anesthesia, came home to my house, fell asleep, woke up again. Now it's about... 8, 10, 12 hours after we got him back from the hospital. And he got up, left the little bed in my bedroom next to my bed and wandered out and came over and started to stare at me like, who the hell are you? Or since I always envisioned him speaking in a French accent, who the hell are you? And he looked at the other dogs like, who the hell are you? Where am I? And where did these other dogs come from? It was instantaneous. Mine did not have dementia. He might have had a little. He was the equivalent then of a 95-year-old man. 
He might have been a little slow. I know this hasn't been a topic anywhere in public discourse lately. He might have been a little slow. But the problem he had was he had these terrible teeth. And the moment they were out and the blood stopped, which was pretty quick, he started to get younger. And I mean, he started to get younger every day. He was a little sharper, a little bit more interactive, still on his own, still sleeping 16, 18 hours a day in a bed that I found for him by accident that he treated like the womb. He would curl up in there and the blissfulness of his sleeping experience made me jealous. And then I took him out for the first time because my last experience with him was he jumped off onto the hard pavement outside Central Park. I don't know if he's a good walker. His serenity upon hearing the sounds of New York City is indescribable. A look would come across his face and whereas indoors he didn't really particularly like you picking him up or holding him, and he certainly didn't like a vet prying at his teeth or anything like that. If you wanted to pick him up and sit him on your lap as long as you were on a park bench, he was the happiest creature on this earth. He'd walk with you for two hours. He'd sit with you for two hours. If you were walking him with another dog, he would immediately sync up with that dog's pace. If it was just you and him, he would sync up with your pace. I swear there were times when I had not stopped or slowed down, and he was slowing down because he knew I was going to. And gradually through that winter and into the spring of 2023, he got more and more interactive. One-tenth of one percent every day. And finally came the day when we went for a walk, and he would sometimes walk with me and my number one girl, Stevie, when we would walk over to the Animal Medical Center, about 40, 45 minutes, he'd walk just for the walk. Perfect companion dog. Other dogs walk to pee or to poop. Mine walked to walk and to walk with you or walk with another dog. An extraordinary creature. And finally, not long after his 16th birthday last year, the most extraordinary thing I have ever experienced with my dogs and the first time Stevie ever relieved herself on a walk, it was under a marquee that read Fox News. And I picked her up and said, I will always love you. So I've seen some extraordinary things, even though I only have 12 years in the world of dog. The most extraordinary thing I ever saw began... Sometime in the late summer last year, maybe about this time, right after Mine turned 16. I saw it briefly out of the corner of my eye and didn't believe what I'd seen. The stripes on the New York City streets are crosswalks. They're almost a barber pole effect, usually white on the black tarmac surface. And sometimes the stripes are two, three inches thick. And Mine was seeing them with his one really good eye and leaping over them. Consider this for a second. Mine had been, a year before, unable to negotiate his way around a new apartment, half because of vision problems, half because of neurological problems that were, in fact, dental problems, almost 100%. And now he was, for some reason, leaping in the air. I thought he was sick. I thought there was some new neurological problem. And then he did it again on a different stripe, and then he did it again up onto a curb. And then we went out on a walk and he did it 10 times. And I began to hear people laughing behind me and getting over my natural paranoia, thinking what's on the back of my pants. I realized people who were not expecting this were seeing this tiny, skinny, eight pound dog who sometimes had to wear a sweater in the summer, jumping up in the air, sometimes reaching... I would say 10 inches off the ground. Last October, I ordered, God help me, a selfie stick. I wanted to see from his level what in the hell he was doing and try to figure out why. I put the selfie stick and put the phone on it, hung it down at his level, and sometimes I shot in slow motion and sometimes in full speed, and I recorded Mine. And I saw something even more startling. There was no question that this was premeditated and intentional, and he was enjoying it because after each jump, he would locate the camera 
and look at it and stare it down like James Harden, the basketball player, backing away after a successful shot. What do you think of that, pal? Mine, of course, without any teeth, had a tongue that hung out of his mouth, adding to his extraordinary cuteness. And this leaping ability, which got better and better the more he tried it, and it was clear he must have done it before you don't suddenly, after years of neurological problems, decide to start becoming an Olympic jumper at 16, at the equivalent of 95 now as a dog, as a human years. He would do this 40 or 50 times on a trip. Sometimes when there were no white stripes, when we weren't crossing anything, when we were in the park, he'd jump over the grooves in the pavement. And I discovered from the videos and from careful analysis that he had three different jumps. He had your standard, I'm running and moving fast and I'm using my own propulsion to just spring upwards and then down and stick the landing, by the way, each time. And he had another one where he knew he was going up onto a curb and he angled himself. His launch angle, baseball fans, was about 5% higher. And then he introduced the third one, the standing jump. He'd be walking across the street and stop and see how far he could go without any momentum. He did this all of last winter. As spring approached, it became evident he was beginning to slow down a little bit of his own accord as his 17th birthday neared, and he didn't do as many jumps at first. His extraordinary longevity and his extraordinary stamina on walks continued. If we wanted to go to two hours in the park? Sure. Maybe you could give me a lift going up the hill. That was his only problem. And the leaps became fewer and farther between, and sometimes a little shorter. And sometimes when he wasn't quite in the mood, he'd just do a little hop. He'd just clear it basically to say, yeah, I can still do this. And then on he'd go. The most extraordinary thing I have ever seen with a dog. And I saw Stevie poop under the Fox News sign. Mine, we had him examined neurologically in March just to see if there was something to make whatever time he had left more enjoyable, easier to get through because he bumped into things. He was beginning to lose control and he'd never had full control of his limbs, which made these jumps even more extraordinary. I, it's not quite he got up out of a wheelchair and did these leaps, but neurologically speaking, it was almost like that. The neurologist had no explanation for this other than he liked it. A very good reason to keep doing it. But he would bump into things and we thought, well, maybe there's something that would help him. And there wasn't, but they did determine they were confident that at some point in the past he'd actually had a stroke. So he had a little dementia and a stroke. And he was an Olympic level hurdler and leaper. He began to bump into things a lot more in the last few months. And I thought, what do I do about this? Well, I'm the only person, I think, in the city of New York whose walls are baby-proofed at a height of about four inches or so. They worked wonderfully. Now when he would bump into a wall, instead of maybe getting a concussion, he would just bounce into some rubber foam. In fact, he learned how to, when he didn't have full control of his legs, guide himself along by putting his head intentionally against the rubber foam and just kind of pushing. He ate like a horse without teeth. He loved the soft meals that I got for him, and he thrived on them. And he would still eat the hard treats that he liked, the kibble. And often he would take a piece of kibble and put it in the water bowl let it soak for a while and come back for it later and suck on it like a cough drop. Dementia my ass. It's one of the smartest beings I have ever met in my life. I don't think I was honest with myself about how Minet began to slow down early in the summer. We didn't get to walk that much because we went directly from spring into hell this year in New York, as I'm sure you've experienced too. It got really warm really fast. He didn't like really warm and he didn't like really cold. Well, hell, he was basically 100 years old now. And as his 17th birthday approached, 
it began to be evident that he was slowing down a little bit. I had to carry him a little bit more. There were occasionally hops, but mostly it was just a good 40-minute walk was a delight for him. We had one last Thursday. It didn't end that well. He seemed to be having real trouble controlling his back legs. Of course, when I got him home, the back legs had gotten stiff and he was kind of folding over them. I got him home. He was fine. He walked around the house for two hours. But he didn't eat that night. And he didn't eat Friday. And he was listless. I will say this for him. In the last four or five months, he had suddenly, uniformly accepted all of us. Where he was always hanging back in my bedroom, in his little womb-like bed, now he would greet me with the other dogs at the front door when I came home. He would often give me a kiss with that big hanging out tongue of his. And in the last few months particularly, he stopped living in the bedroom and would often just stagger out into the living room where the dogs and I were working. I was working. The dogs really weren't. I have to confess that. He would come out, come over and give me a kiss on the ankle. If I wanted to pick him up and he wanted to be picked up, he would come and sit with us for a while. And then he'd sort of motion like he wanted to get down back on the floor. And he'd go over to his bed in the living room and sleep out here with us for eight hours. Just out of a sense of community. So he was still doing that. And then wandering back in to sleep on the floor next to the bed because obviously I couldn't keep him in the bed with the other dogs and me. He tended to fall off things like that. No matter how good a jumper you are, you're not a good jumper if you don't know you're about to jump. And then last Thursday, he wasn't really eating. And last Friday, he was very listless. And I took him in my arms and I went outside and sat on the balcony and had a long conversation with him. And I said, you're just wearing out. And the feeling I got back was, yeah, but I have some time. He didn't urinate at all. And this was one of his major hobbies. He tried so hard. He had been so good at the pad. And he tried so hard. And I think he thought he was doing real well. Unfortunately, his definition of what the pad was became a little broader than it should have been. Any soft surface became the pad. But he wasn't peeing. He didn't pee Friday. And he didn't eat. And you don't have to be a 12-year dog owner or a one-year dog owner to know if your dog stops eating and he's old, he's checking out. And so I envisioned this Friday night, having just celebrated his 17th birthday, an extraordinary accomplishment for any dog, but particularly one who had a stroke and neurological problems and was nearly starved to death at some point. Like he's done a great job. We'll let him go. We don't have to do anything about it. He'll go on his own, particularly if he's not eating. And then Saturday morning, he had getting up out of bed because he was still sleeping. He called to me a couple of times to come out and just hold him for a little bit. And he had a surprisingly high little bark. His I'm hungry bark was rawr, rawr. very French. His uh, hello was a puppy, a high-pitched puppy bark. He barked and got up to greet me and fell over and wriggled like a dead bug on the floor for about a minute. It was a miniature seizure, and given his neurological history, I actually thought it was good news because it suggested maybe there was something to fix here. Maybe it wasn't just placidly saying, okay, time. You know it. I know it. Took him into the animal medical center. Took him at the advice of all the people I know over there into the emergency room. Treated wonderfully. They said, he's low on fluids. We can do this much for him. Leave him here overnight. We'll assess in the morning. We'll get him fluids. We'll get him a little shunt here and get in, you know, take his blood work and see how his kidneys are doing. Because he had kidney problems his whole life. Apparently, anecdotally, that's in the documentary they won't let me see about him. Kidding. Sunday morning, I got a phone call saying he'd had a good night. Nothing had changed. He wasn't any better. He wasn't any worse. He was 
alert. An hour later, I got a call from the internal medicine people who had taken over his case from the emergency room. They said, no, he's not. Things have not gone well. His kidney values are down to zero. His temperature is down. He's developed a heart murmur, and his heart was his strongest organ. He's not really responding. He's not standing on his own. You ought to consider this is the end. And you may want to hasten the end because there's no evidence it hurts. But if your organs are going to start shutting down, it may begin to hurt fairly soon and in very, very unpleasant ways, in addition to the fear and the shock and the confusion. And so I made the decision to do that. Sunday afternoon, I went over, picked him up, and thought, well, it's not like there's a rush here or anything. But what is it he likes most in the world? Outdoors in the city. Near the Animal Medical Center is the 59th Street Bridge, or for you out-of-towners, the Edward, Edward and Koch Bridge, Queensboro. We don't even like to call it the Queensboro Bridge. That's for people in Queens. Us Manhattanites, we call it the 59th Street Bridge. There's a song, the 59th Street Song. 59th Bridge Strong Song. So we went and sat in the new park that they built in some... I don't know, I think abandoned exit from the FDR drive. And the breeze was perfect. It was a little warm, but the breeze was perfect. And Minet, barely able to raise his head, sat there and took little sips of water from water that I put on his tongue with my finger. And he would stretch, stretching like he was asleep and just stretching, getting comfortable and sitting there with me and communing. Supposed to be there, I think, my plan was, I guess, half an hour or an hour and then take him inside and give him the medication that would end his life. Well, we were there three and a half hours. Again, what's the rush? There is, I will say this, for any dog owner who worries about their dog, and I shouldn't say owner, anybody owned by a dog who worries about their dog, there is an extraordinary liberation to a time like that. Make it three and a half hours. Take him out of the hospital. What's the difference? Give him a cigarette. You're not going to hurt him. That's what I said. They said, well, if he begins to have, if he has another seizure, bring him back. I was like, why? <laughs> what's what's going to harm him? We want him to die painlessly. That's all I'm concerned about. Is he in pain? Doesn't look like it. So we sat out there for three and a half hours, and it was a period of time with no fear or anxiety, or stress, or how can I screw this up? And he seemed to enjoy it too. The breeze was wonderful. He always loved the breeze in New York City. And the sounds of the FDR drive, and the river, and the bridge, and the tram going overhead, my God. And then I reached to put some water on his tongue, and he didn't really respond to it. And he hadn't stretched in probably 20, 25 minutes. And a couple of birds flew by. And I thought, it's time. The rest of it, if you've ever been through it, fairly routine. I mean, a good to the last drop. Gets the injection. And one last convinced moment that he was at the pee pad. He peed on my pants. <laughs> I actually smiled. He broke the tension. I'll wax philosophical at a later time about the value of adopting or being adopted by a geriatric dog, not just a senior dog, but a senior dog is okay too, but a dog that needs a home. Nothing like it. I'll wax philosophical and poetic about that at some future time. Spare me doing it now. I will give him credit for extraordinary timing. I got to 17. Anything else you need? All right. Check, please. Minet Germain Olbermann.
July 15th, 2007. To July 21st, 2024. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, were arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Old Rimming theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc., if we ever run sports again. Talk to me about it in November. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. My announcer today was my friend Dennis Leary. Everything else was pretty much my fault, and everything else was dedicated to me nay. That's Countdown for this, the 106th day until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,293rd day since convicted felon Donald Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the September 18th sentencing hearing. Use the mental health system. You've got it, Mr. President. Use presidential immunity to stop the crazy old man from doing it again while we still can. While you still can. And Republicans... Please stop shooting at Trump. By the way, I will never be not convinced that Mine stuck around to hear that President Biden had made the courageous decision that he'd made. For all I know, Mine caused it. Look, come over here. You can jump with me. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news requires. Until then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.